basically want to be going into that workout knowing that blood sugar is stable you've got enough energy from both muscle glycogen and liver glycogen they are available to push hard through that workout and then you've got enough protein amino acids in the bloodstream so as you start going through those first you know sets where you're breaking down muscle tissue that that um, recovery process is, is already starting <laughs> I'm Kitty Bloomfield, co-founder of New Strength and Saturate, creator of pro-metabolic food supplements and seriously saturated skincare. And today I'm joined by my co-host and co-founder, Craig McDonald. Welcome back, Craig. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure it's to be here. It's always a pleasure. We're just inside, outside of our office in our new podcast. New podcast. Studio, yeah, which like we're it. loving. So much light is, in here. It's really nice. Which is awesome. We're, nice. uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, now today's topic, mm. we wanted to talk about, well, what I wanted you to talk about was training when it comes to like ha- how how do we think about training when it comes to body recomposition yes and then how to fuel your body to get you most out of your training because i think a lot of women who follow me or us and who come to us were probably like me so i used to get up in the morning as you're aware eat nothing <laughs> drink black coffee mm-hmm. and then vlog the fuck out of myself for two hours mm-hmm. <laughs> and then i'd eat nothing for the rest of the day yeah and, you know, I had a lot of issues quite, and I... Quite incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe I... How did I... I I'm pretty... Will, I have a lot of willpower. You do. You know? You yeah. Do. But, um, I mean, you used to let it all out on the weekends. That's right. Binge eat. Yeah. You drink a heap of so. booze and then binge all day Sunday and then get back on the wagon <laughs> on Monday. <laughs> Uh, oh. And, you know, I think... I always used to think about training as a way to burn calories. Yes. Instead of actually training training to build muscle. Yep. And I was t- talk about... You know, I say to women, this is about building the body that you want not destroying the body that you have with crazy ass diets and restrictive Mm. you know and hours of cardio so talk about you know how do you how do women change their perspective on training yes you know like because i think women was like i need to train to burn calories yeah yeah and and i think that's the point that we want to hammer on we we've got to look at if we if we talk about you know lifting weights comparatively to cardio when you do cardio, you're going to be burning three, four times the amount of calories. You just are. Your, ha- your heart rate's going to be much more elevated for an extended period of time. You're going to be burning more calories. A, 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 a weight train, like a hard leg session, like if we actually break this down. So let's say you do three sets of squats, you know, two sets of leg presses, you know, a couple of sets of leg curls, a couple of sets of leg extensions, maybe a set of walking, you know, like, you know, some, some kind of high volume leg workout like that. If you were to sit there and actually add up the time spent doing the set. So one set of squats for a set of 10 might take you 15 to 20 seconds, mm. right? By the time you unrack the bar and do your set and then rack it's like 20 seconds of work. So times that by three sets, you know, it's, that's a minute work. That's one exercise down for a, a minute total work. You do the leg presses, the lunges, and that sort of thing. So you might be in the, the gym for, you know, 60 to 90 minutes. Mm. But when you actually work it out, you might be doing six, seven, eight minutes of total work time. Yeah, it's quite short. I it's think we've added it up one day, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, fuck all. Yeah, it's fuck all. So when you actually think of it like that, the, the act of going through a weight training workout is going to be burning minimal amount of calories. You might, maybe a hundred, maybe one hundred and fifty if you're lucky and you've got a bit more muscle. You're obviously mm-hmm. burning a little bit more, but it's very minimal. It's very minimal. And when we actually look at total daily energy expenditure, obviously we've got the four components of that. So your your basal metabolic rate, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So so. Um, Basal metabolic rate will be anywhere up to like 75% of mm. your total daily energy expenditure. So part, it's interesting part of that um, BMR can go anywhere from 55 to 75% of your total daily energy expenditure per day. And the people that generally are up on that top end of BMR are the ones that have more muscle. Mm. So you'll be burning more calories at rest, which is essentially what having more muscle is, is metabolically expensive tissue. After that, you've got your non-activity, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So like just, you know, we generally count that as steps or, you know, doing the dishes or, you know, all of that kind of movement that isn't specific to exercise. That's going to be up to about 15% Mm -hmm. of your total daily energy expenditure. 
Then after that, you've got the thermic effect of food. So obviously eating enough protein because mm. the, the extraction process of the amino acids and other vitamins and minerals from certainly from protein-based foods is, is a, a more taxing process. Um, obviously, if you eat a bit more fiber in your diet as well, that's going to have a thermic effect. And then after that, the remaining 5% or something is going to be uh, your exercise activity. So when you're in the gym lifting weights. So it's, it's, it's such a minimal amount of your total daily energy expenditure that going in and doing weights, even if you were to train six and seven days a week, mm. the actual total daily energy expenditure you would get from doing that would be still so minimal mm. that what you end up doing is just creating a bigger deficit hole in terms of your fatigue mm. that... You're no longer building muscle. You're actually probably taking it away because you're not training in a manner that's going to create mechanical tension to actually build the muscle. What you're doing is creating a lot of soreness and metabolic stress, which is just a, a stress on top of stress on top of the body for no real physiological adaptation. And not to mention just walking around sore all the time. <laughs> like, that's not fun. And then the actual amount of calories that you're getting from this whole process is so minimal anyway. It's just such a backward approach. And this is ultimately why people just fail year after year after year mm. because they're looking at it as like, I'm going to do weights, I'm going to burn calories. And it's just like, it's, you just, that's just not how it works. Mm. The act of going through a weight training workout, and this is why it's called weight training, is the goal is to train the weight, to add more weight and to get stronger. When you, when you actually are doing your workout and your sets in a way that's highly stimulating. So you're using a relative load where you're failing in that five to eight, you know, maybe up to 10 rep range. You're going to be getting, you know, five or so stimulating reps, the ones that are actually uh, calling upon those high threshold motor units, which are the ones that have the biggest propensity for it to actually grow. And therefore you're actually going to be growing muscle. Mm. So you're training the weight in a way to grow muscle, not to burn calories. And there is a big division there, <laughs> big division. I think too, you know, like how I try and explain it to women is, you know, for so long you've just been trying to get small, get small, diet, diet, diet. And we, you want to build the body yeah. that yes. you want. So, yes. you know, instead of just always thinking about, okay, what's the body weight that I'll get to? And yes, the body weight's important because, you know, if you're 80 kilos and you're, 20% body fat, you'd be the most jacked fucking female ever. <laughs> but the process and how we're different is we focus on body recomposition, which is yes. building muscle and losing body fat. Correct. And the majority of our clients, mm. because they're either new to lifting or they're not actually lifting properly, like me, mm. will actually be able to do that. And if you, act if you give your body enough nutrients and fuel, so eat at maintenance calories, your lean muscle will, will, muscle will go up and your fat will come down. And then when you get to this, this new ideal body weight or body composition you're just going to look so much better yep. and you're going to be able to eat more food and you know as as we get older i think some of the women that we work with they're in their 40s their 50s they're going through menopause you know something that i know kate and i did a great podcast on perimenopause around um you know women as their hormones shift you know they they Str they, sh they struggle more to, I guess, for their cells to utilize glucose. So, yeah. like, having more muscle is going to improve your insulin sensitivity yes. and your body's ability Absolutely. to actually utilize carbohydrates so you can eat more. So, it's not just about how you look. It's going to affect the way that you feel. And who doesn't want to eat more carbs? Like, I think that yeah. that's – you've got to get out of your head that – I just want to be small. I just want to lose weight too. I want to build muscle. Mm -hmm. I want to build muscle. And think when you go into the gym, if you haven't eaten anything mm – -hmm and you're trying to lift some weights, like do you really think you're going to be able to give your best performance? Yeah. And I've noticed a difference so much in when I'm actually eating adequate calories and I go into the gym and I've had a good sleep. It's like my performances are just incredible. Yeah. And then you can continue to progress those weights. You know, if, in, if you, let's say you're deadlifting 50 kilos for 10 reps and then you can deadlift 90 kilos for 10 reps, mm -hmm. you know, you are going to have more muscle mm -hmm. and that requires fuel. So I think that's the sort of shift, that, that was the shift for me. Yes is eating enough to actually fuel my training so I could make progress. Yep. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, like we've sort of spoken about before about, you know, toning a muscle. Mm -hmm. and it's like a muscle will either grow or it will, or it will shrink. And, you know, I guess the bodybuilding industry has a lot to kind of answer for from this. They're like, oh, if you, you know, when you do your hack squats, if you turn your feet out slightly, you're going to be working more of your VMA and that's going to give you this quad sweep that, that looks like this it's just like 
Shut the fuck up with that stuff. That is, that's not how it goes at all. <laughs> your, your muscles and your muscle bellies and the shape of your muscles are predetermined at birth, mm. right? If I wanted big IFBB <laughs> type calves, right? My goal should be not to be born to my fucking parents mm. because both of my parents have no calves. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that, and, and I've been able to, to, you know, build on them and go through the process of making them bigger as I've gotten stronger, absolutely. But comparatively to somebody else with a certain genetic potential, like remember Joe who, who used to work in the gym with us, mm. he'd never done a calf raise <laughs> in his life. <laughs> he's so jacked. He's and this Filipino dude. He's like 50, in his 50s. He, he looks he's amazing. Awesome. He's amazing. Yeah. And he just, like, he'd never done a calf and, and he's, he, he just had these massive calves and it was just, it was kind of one of those things of, like, Sometimes clients would ask him, like, oh, what do you do for your calves? And I'm like, it's, he does it's, sweet FA. it's the yeah. wrong question to ask him because yeah. he already had them. It's no different to me going up to Shaquille O'Neal and going, hey, Shaq, how did you become seven foot seven and, and <laughs> whatever? I'm like, it's not going to, the answer is I need to be born to his parents. So that there is a genetic factor there that your muscle belly, bellies and the attachments of those muscles uh, give them a certain look. But ultimately at the end of the day your muscles will either grow or shrink they don't do anything else and they will grow when you continue to create mechanical tension and use progressive overload over time just get stronger to get stronger, get stronger. and that's and that's that's it the and, only thing you can do and you know like there'll be the abnormalities like you the, the chicks that i see at the gym that black chick that i told you about oh yeah oh yeah she's incredible yeah. like she's she's so jacked and she's huge ass and big quads. And I was like, and she's oh, excuse got this me, tiny, can, I, tiny can, I little waist, can I take a photo of you? Massive quad and these big shoulders. And, and she I, trains I, and she doesn't lift anywhere near the oh. weights that I lift. And some women will say, yeah, but Kitty, but there's this woman. I said, there will be people that just genetically have big muscles and they're not strong. Yeah. But well, 98, well, 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 let, they let, have the capability. They have they the just, capability. Yeah, she, have. she absolutely could be deadlifting and squatting could, more but, than you. But she, she can naturally. You can't have that much tissue on your body. And not, not, not be able be to capable. do it. But she probably thinks, why fucking bother? Well, exactly. Because I already look so awesome. What, if, like, you, I don't, if you don't need to put hard, yourself through really those <laughs> grueling fucking workouts and already look good, I'm like, why would you? <laughs> this Absolutely. is true. But I think, Absolutely. you know, you've got to remember, you've got to remember that in like a, a woman texted me on Instagram yesterday and she said, oh, she, I think I was leg pressing or something. She's like, Kitty, I really want to look like, you know, you, you look defined and sort mm. of muscular, but not super lean. And mm. she's like, do I need to do a fat loss phase? And I said, well, Probably, most probably not not mm. you know most of the women 98 percent of the women are just under muscled you say 100 100 percent. you yeah. need to spend the time lifting and getting stronger and training hard yeah building the muscle absolutely then you're going to look like you want to look and i think that's where so many women go wrong yes. with this and that's you know this is why we're emphasizing the training and just becoming more capable and you're going to look athletic and strong when you can become capable of lifting yeah, more exactly yeah it, it's it's you will look like that version of yourself that you envisage when the 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 capability in the gym matches that mm. do you know like it, it, it's like if you if you've got small shoulders small delts and you want to have nice round delts <laughs> it's like go onto the smith machine do a overhead press and i want you to add 20 kilos to that bar today mm. and do mm. it and the reality is everyone would unequivocally go well i can't do that and my answer is i know that's why your shoulders don't look like the way you want them to look yeah but when you become capable of being able to do that overhead press with that extra 20 kilos your shoulders are going to look very different yeah. so now you have to embrace that journey and understand how you train in a way allows your execution and form to be really on point standardized so you're getting the maximum amount of stimulus on a per rep basis mm. but also program in a way to allow you to reach that kind of strength milestone mm. because the thing is you either become capable of lifting those weights and you change or you don't become capable and you don't change mm. there is no other way method or should i be doing more sets or should i be training more and doing that? i'm like you're asking all the wrong fucking questions yeah it's like where do i need to get my deadlift to yeah i remember when we first met and mm. you know i was deadlifting and i could deadlift like 60 kilos yeah and you're like you need to be able to deadlift 120 yeah and i was like oh wow mm. like that's a lot more than i can deadlift now and you're yeah. like oh, obviously yeah, yeah. obviously <laughs> and, <laughs> and then when i could deadlift that yeah. you know i started to look different yes you know, and it wasn't about do I need to train more? Do I need to do a million? You know, like 
do five sets. Yeah. It was no. Like mm. in, in time, how do you actually get to that 120 kilos? Yeah. Yeah. So and, and if you get there by doing five sets, okay, well, cool. That's the answer to the question. Mm. The thing is there's no right way of getting there. You, you, you just have to get there. Mm. So like, it's the same with the whole training to failure or using the reps and reserve or RP mm. models. People are like, oh, you know, you should do more sets and keep reps and reserve. I'm like, do whatever the fuck you want. Again, you either add a significant amount of weight to the bar and become mm. capable of you don't. Where, where, what strategy or what split or whatever you do makes no difference. Like you have, and, that needs to be the end goal. That's oh. the only <laughs> question you ever need to fucking ask. Obviously, there's a, you know, like over the years, Craig has worked with a lot of different people, tested a lot of different things. Yeah. And, you know, he's developed a methodology that he believes, like a framework that will help get you the best results, yeah. you know, in... I guess doing the least amount of work. Yeah. You know, you have to do a minimum amount of work, but but, yeah. but most well, of mean, our clients that, that, don't want to spend hours and hours and hours and hours in the gym. No, you know, but no. there is a minimum amount you have to do. Yeah, and and, and look, just just to give some insight on this. So uh, often, a lot of the times, depending on the person, you might start on a lower volume. But generally, I I would often get a lot of clients to go through a bit more of a higher volume model where they're doing three sets. You know per exercise and it's a linear progression so they add they've got to add weight every single time and i'll program what those weights are and the reps that they need to hit but that continues to build on that same pattern for weeks and weeks and weeks on end because what i know is their second set in terms of performance the weight they lift and whatever will be better than the first and then the third set will also be better than that mm. and what it needs to get to is that it goes the opposite way that the first set becomes mm. their very best set and then the second and third set are, mm. are, are ones that actually go a bit backwards. Mm. Once they get to that point, then we change the whole structure and we start going to like a total rep sort of model. Mm. But the reality is everyone has a baseline capability. It's reflective of how much lean body mass that they have right now. Mm. But the, the thing is most people are underperforming in the way they're doing their exercise in a way is not actually expressing that true strength based off what they have. Mm. So my method is to get them to that point as quickly and as efficiently as possible because i know that for them to see that true change it's going to require them to be lifting weights that are beyond their current capability for them to actually start to look truly different mm. but that lag time up to that point is going to be different for everyone depending on their training age and how well they can execute and their time availability and how well they do their nutrition and their sleep there's a lot of variables that go into it to get them mm. to that point but a lot of this is where a lot of people they can train for a while and they don't see a lot of progress. It's just like, yeah, we well, haven't really moved the needle in terms of capability, mm. Mm. you know. So I try and set it up in a way that people get to that capability sooner. But that often means that they're going to be in the gym potentially a little bit longer than they'd like. But that's only and, and they're like, well, how long I've got to continue to do this? I'm like, until you get to that baseline mm. level, and then all of a sudden the the you'll be lifting it at an intensity that forces the volume to come down yeah like us yeah. like me like i can't do a lot no you just can't because the, the because of the way you execute that the stimulus is so high that it comes with an inherent amount of fatigue with that mm. and the the amount of volume that you can tolerate at this point for the weights that you lift has to be lower because when when you're executing and you're lifting in such a high effort state it's it's a trade-off you can either train really really hard or you can train a lot but you can't do both yeah right that that fatigue is going to be the difference there in your ability to recover but we always want to look at it on a per set basis of how well you're executing and how stimulating those reps are because mm. that's how you ultimately determine your volume mm. it's not based on how many sets per body part you should be doing it should be based on the amount of effective reps you're getting on a per set basis per body part per mm. week you know, and that might be 20 effective reps per body part for some people. It might mm. be 30. You know, some people can do a little bit more because yeah. some people have genetic, rec ge yeah. genetic factors yeah. that just allows them to have a greater work capacity. And that, that ultimately needs to come down to that individualization. But that's only something that you can understand what it is after you've gone through a process to ultimately determine that black mm. and white. Mm. It's like, when I do it like this, I shit the bed. When I do yeah. it like this and I yeah. do these exercises in this order and over time as I get more specialized, then I can recover and I can continue to make progress. And often when you get really, really good at it, that, that, those, that amount of work is going to be probably less than you think. 
I think too, you know, women like most of the women in our program train three to four days a week. Yeah. And get amazing results. So you don't have yeah. to be in the gym five, six days a week. No. You know, if you and I've done that. I've done yeah. it five days. Yeah. I've done six days a week programming, yeah. you know, and I've always assessed that over time. I'm like, am I actually moving the needle? And every time I would do the six days, it would just bite me in the ass. Mm. Even if I was doing minimal, it was just that that peripheral fatigue and that central nervous system fatigue just rolling. Out. Even if I was doing, if I did a, like a push day, like chest, shoulders, mm. triceps, and the next day would be back, completely different muscle groups. It just wouldn't matter. It would, there was still an inherent fatigue that would roll over into that where I could feel that I just couldn't put as much effort into my back because I was under-recovered from the chest session. So even though those same muscle groups weren't worked, it doesn't matter. Fatigue mm. inherently mm. comes across. And it's just, you realize that, okay, if I just look at certain lifts, if I look at my Smith overhead press and I look at my V-hack squat and I look at my, you know, hammer strength incline press and I look at my stiff leg deadlift and I look at all of these big movements that I know that if I add a significant amount of weight to that Mm. those body parts are going to look the way I want them to look, then all of a sudden I just need to program in a way that allows for maximum recovery and maximal effort on those lifts each and every session to allow me to progressively overload. And for some people, they would look at that and they go, well, you're not doing a lot of work. You're not going to grow like that. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? If I go in to the next session and I can't progressively overload, like I can't add a bit more weight for for the same amount of reps or Mm. same weight for more reps or double progression where I add a bit of weight and get more reps, if I don't tick any of those boxes and I stall or I actually go backwards – well, how the fuck doing more work to put me into more of a recovery deficit is going to help me progressively overload? It's back. It, that doesn't make any sense. How can yeah. I possibly do that? So just to recap on these points, that version of yourself that you want to become has more muscle than you do currently. Mm. The way to build more muscle is to set up your training program that allows for the best execution to failure on each and every set in a rep range that's going to reduce as much fatigue and muscle damage as possible. Generally, anything above eight reps on most exercises doesn't make a lot of sense. Maybe on arms, you can go 10, 12 or whatever. But a lot of that, you know, that uh, metabolic stress and muscle damage that comes from doing a lot of high reps doesn't actually add any growth at all. Mm. For a long time, it was believed that it does, but it, it just doesn't. It actually reduces motor unit recruitment for your following sessions. So you're better off getting the maximum amount of mechanical tension and stimulus with the less amount of fatigue as mm. possible. So keep it keep it a moderate weight below eight reps at failure. And then if you go in to do a session and you're feeling underdone and you're not going to be able to progressively overload, and sometimes you can tell that from your I, – I can certainly tell as an advanced person from my warm-ups, I will literally leave the gym and I'll go for a walk. Mm. There's For me, I, I – and, and this is something, and I wouldn't recommend people who are beginning and listening to this to, to potentially do that unless you're really, really fucked, but you shouldn't just go to the gym anyway if you've had a really bad sleep. Sometimes you've just got to suck it up and push it through because the likelihood of you progressively overloading in a kind of underdone state is still going to happen. In my, once I get to, like, you, know, you get to an advanced level, you just know that it just won't happen. Like, mm. you've got to be able to tick all the boxes. But I think certainly from um, creating that habit of going in and training hard and, and just learning to be consistent with that and knowing that every session should be hard because you're there to build muscle, not burn calories or shape and tone of muscle. You are there to get really strong. That's it. If Mm. you get strong and you progressively overload, job done. And then you let the nutrition and your activity from steps continue to improve your body composition. So let's finish off with talking about actually fueling your training, which is what we started talking about. (laughs) Was that the point of this podcast? Yeah. So I think, you know, something we do is if you would... So, pre, so it, let's it, just talk purely about nutrition. Pre, your pre-training meal is better than your post-training meal, okay? So as a rough rule of thumb, you want to be having a protein source where you're getting at least 20 grams or more of protein. So, you know, 20 to 30 grams, something like that, you know, some meat sort of product or, you know, like if, if you – you train in the morning whatever maybe it's some eggs maybe you have a casein in your coffee something where you're going to get at least 20 grams of protein or more and then carbohydrates and again depends on how many calories you're on but i reckon at least double that you know Mm. 40 grams or more 50 grams carbohydrates if you can get it from both carbohydrate sources so like fruit for example it's going to you know replenish liver glycogen and then maybe some some starch to kind of replenish muscle glycogen 
obviously those stores would happen from the day before of eating as well. Like it's not just that one meal, but you basically want to be going into that workout knowing that blood sugar is stable. You've got enough energy from both muscle glycogen and liver glycogen. They're available to um, allow you to push hard through that workout. And then you've got enough protein, amino acids in the bloodstream. So as you start going through those first you know, sets where you're breaking down muscle tissue that that um, recovery process is, is already starting. And I think if you, like we talked about, if you're focusing on body recomposition, you're not eating in a deficit, you're eating at those maintenance calories and then Mm. looking at when you're actually training and, you know, like for example, for me, I train at about one ish. So I'll eat a big breakfast and I have another meal at 11. I just had it now. I had prawns, rice with broth and fruit. Mm -hmm. So, and then now I'm going to go and train. So I've had two big meals before I've trained. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I think it's it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It doesn't have to be a special meal. It just has to tick those boxes tick that those you boxes. talked about. And then exactly. looking at your meal structure for the day and going, is this easy? Does it work for me? Am I eating adequate calories before training? Yes. What about someone who gets up early? Because that's a question I get a lot. Who yeah, is, so that's, that's how I do things. So, yep. so my pre-training meal is also my breakfast meal. Yep. So it, it's probably the biggest meal of the day for me. Mm. So I, you know, I'll have... Uh, my casein coffee, a couple of shots of coffee, 300 mils of milk, you know, maple syrup in that. And then I'll have um, my rice pudding, like 350 grams of rice pudding. Mm. And then I'll cut up strawberries and blueberries and mm. I'll put that in that. I'll probably have an orange as well. Like I'm, I'm getting probably around 35 grams of protein and probably up around 80 or 90 grams of carbohydrates mm. um, during that time. So like that's, that's pretty... And what about, because a lot of women, you know, they, they say to me, this is just a question that I get, okay, I get up and then I have to train within half an hour. So they're yes. not like you where they've got enough time to let it digest. Would you say then try and focus on something that's lighter, quicker and easier to digest? Because sometimes yeah. it's sort of going, what's the best that I can do? Yeah, I, I, I think in that situation, like, a, like obviously a shake is really, really good. But I, I think something that's going to really stimulate, like, like a double shot coffee with milk and casein and then putting some honey in yeah, there, or maple and a syrup, banana, ripe or a banana, banana. I mean, just yeah. eat a banana, something like that. That's yeah. what I used to have yep. in the gym when yep. we used to train early yep. in the morning, yep. which and was then, really and good. And then, you know, have some orange juice with it as well. Yeah, like all of that stuff is going to give you everything from a nutrient perspective, like putting, you know, magnesium and potassium, um, which are intracellular nutrients in there. You're getting some calcium, which is really important for muscular contractions. Obviously, you're getting the protein source there, so you're going to have those amino acids floating around. So you obviously get the um, the protein from the milk, but then also like the casein as well. Maybe you can mm. add some collagen in as well, the glycine. Um, and, uh, and then obviously those, those carbohydrate sources just to fuel your training. So I think that that's something that everyone can do. And I mean, if you want it super convenient, you make it the night before. Yeah. You have it in the fridge, you stick it in the microwave and you neck it down. I think too, yeah. if you are eating, training really early in the morning, make sure you're having a really good dinner yeah. and a, a before bed snack. Yes. So you're sort of loading that towards Pre- the end yep, of, I yeah, agree. yeah. Yep. Yeah. That can be another strategy. And then even if you're really stuck, you know, something that I used to do or you could do if you train really early is you could have like the orange juice, the coconut water, the um, – what's that stuff the, that used to put in the carbs? It's really – Oh, the cyclic digestion. Cyclic digestion, salt. Yeah. yeah. You know, you could put a bit of whey protein if you wanted in there if you just wanted that really quick carb source. Let's just say that you yeah, just can't eat anything. Like you just – absolutely, I have to get up and train. Yeah then at least you're having some carbs. Like, and just you want it to absorb quickly and yeah. spike that blood sugar quickly because you need to access those that energy quickly. So it's quickly. fine. You know, yep. we often talk about eating the protein carbs together, but that's something that then like an intra-workout drink that you could have with yep. the salt, yep. um, you know. But I think it's, it's always going to be better if you can just train, You like have something to eat. Mm-hmm. You'll just – and I know it can be difficult – I found it difficult to start with because I was so used to training fasted. Yes. But once I actually sort of forced my body, built up those calories, my, my performance in the gym was just so much better. Yeah. You and know? I think if you're, if you're paying attention to the workouts you're doing, you follow the structured programming and you're, you're looking at progressive overload, you'll just notice that that progressive overload will happen more consistently if you're well fueled. Mm. You know, you're like, you, you just, you can't get to a point where you want maximal performance and you've got no energy to do it. Mm. <laughs> the body just doesn't respond that way. Yeah. Um, no matter how hard you are mindset wise, I'm like, mm. from a physiological perspective, if the energy sources aren't there, your body needs to break down your own body in order to extract yeah. those energy you just, sources. You just, you honestly, you'll just things. get better performances, won't you? Yep. Like, just try it. You better yep. try it. Yep. 
So that's it. Anything else? I think it's no? pretty good. All right. As always, guys, uh, take a screenshot and share your biggest takeaways on Instagram stories and tag me at kitty, K-I-T-T-Y-B-L-O-M-F-I-E-L-D. And each month I pick a winner and they get a tub of Satray premium collagen valued at $79. And we'll see you again next time. Bye.